I am privileged to be here. Uh, I want to thank your pastor, uh, even though he spells his name the wrong way. <laughs> I'm playing. He'd actually say that about me, right? It's actually I-E, not Y. But uh, it's, uh, it's been so good to see his fingerprints uh, implanted upon each of your lives. And you guys have been so welcoming to us. Candy, my wife, and I have been just overwhelmed by the hospitality. So thank you for welcoming us. We have enjoyed our time here. You have an amazing staff here, and I think you know that, but uh, amazing <laughs> staff here. We thank the Lord for them. Uh, if you were here last week and I saw the message online, Craig talked about how our statures were a little different. Uh, Craig and I have decided to work out together. So I'm going to help. <laughs> going to help him, give him a little plan, and we're going to get him in shape. No. <laughs> but seriously. But seriously, no. Uh, what I want to talk to you about is something that I am ultra passionate about, and that is making disciples. And I want to do it from a very familiar text, and you're going to say, well, I know this text very well, but I want to look at this text from a fresh perspective, and my prayer is that you'll have some insights and see some, some things that you may not have seen otherwise. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, and when uh, you get to verse 16, you can say word, we like to say word at Long Hollow, the church I have the privilege of pastoring, because we know it's the word that changes our lives, right? Not funny stories, not cool illustrations, not my sense of humor. If you came for that, you're not going to get much, but what you will get today is the word, amen? Uh, so when we get there, you can say word. word. Say it like you mean it. Word. Amen. Uh, just want to say, I, again, my wife can't... How, how many ladies were here this week, by the way, this weekend? Okay, awesome. Candy loved the time with y'all as well, and so... Uh, I hear some guys whistling. I don't know. Are you maybe there as well? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but some of the guys were with me, so we, we did have a great time as well. What I want to talk about is a strategy to change the world. And I want to give you a plan and a process uh, that Jesus gave us. And you know as well as I do, sometimes you can plan and you can organize uh, and you can put together this great strategy, but things change, Right? Candy and I got to the airport, my wife Candy, we, we got there uh, Thursday afternoon. And uh, I just want to tell you, we've been looking forward to coming here for months, and we were really excited. And what was really cool about the Lord is I was able to organize the trip here around the first trip ever in the history of the church I'm pastoring to Israel. So what's crazy is I have a team from Nashville flying in tomorrow. Immediately after church, I'm going to the Toronto airport to meet my team from Long Hollow, and we're going to a 10-day trip to Israel, right? Really, and really awesome. It just happened to work perfectly, right? And so we had been planning this trip, and we worked with a travel agent, and she planned this trip, and so it was planned months later. And so Kenny and I had a printout, right? So we go to the airport Thursday. We're there two hours early, because that's what they tell you. We walk up to the counter, and there's no one there at Air Canada. Have you ever flown Air Canada? <laughs> it's a first for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, there's nobody at the counter. You know, like, so we're standing there for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I'm like, is anybody working? So I asked the Air Alaska people. I'm like, hey, is anybody working at Air? Do people still go to Canada? I mean, apparently there's like nobody flying. She... <laughs> She's like, no, 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 the people go, like, like they're flying. She said, let me call somebody. So they call this guy, he walks up. He's, a, he's like a guy that works on the runway, and they just pulled him out the back. You know, he's like, he's like, yeah, I guess, I guess I can help. And so he starts typing away, and he's like, what time are you supposed to leave? I said, we're supposed to leave in two hours because we're, you know, we're speaking tomorrow. And he's like, I'm sorry, that flight doesn't exist. I'm like, what do you mean it doesn't exist? And I got a piece of paper here that says it. He said, no, no, that flight doesn't exist. It's not even in the system. He's like, I was like, well, can I get on another flight? He said, yeah, you can call Air Canada and book tomorrow yourself. So I called a travel agent. I'm like, and I'm at the airport, you know, and, I, and I'm doing it with the love of Christ, of course. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, we're supposed to be on a flight here, you know, like, like we don't have much margin for, for, for messing up. And, and she's like, yeah, well, she's like, I don't know what happened. She's like, we had a plan to get you there. And her words were, but plans change. I'm like, apparently plans do change, right? Well, what I want to talk to you about today is that how plans may change in life. Aren't you glad that when Jesus gave a plan to his disciples 2,000 years ago, 
to make disciples. It is the exact same plan he gives us today. It's the exact same plan. Aren't you glad God's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Right. That is plan A to change the world. That is the mission that God has given us. And so what I want to do in our time today is I want to show you why we need to make disciples. And then I'm going to challenge us with the how in making disciples. So if you have your Bibles and you're at Matthew 28 and uh, you're there at verse 16, you can say word. word. Amen. Uh, I'm reading out of the CSB Bible. You can read out of any Bible you want. People say, what's the best translation to read from? I say the one you read from, right? <laughs> because most people argue for translations they never read from. Uh, but the one you read is the best. Verse 16, the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Now, have you ever wondered about that? Like, like how can you be doubting Jesus or what's happening? We'll get back to that. Jesus said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or obey all that I've commanded you, and behold or remember that I am with you always to the what? Amen. To the end of the age. Let's pray as we begin. Father, we pray that you would show us with perfect clarity what you expect from us in participating in the Great Commission. And God, I just know in a group this size, many different people from different backgrounds, different classes of life, different testimonies, different upbringings, the one thing that unites us is that we are all desperate and in need of grace. And we know, God, that you're not only a Savior who saved us from something, you actually saved us for something. And so we pray today that you'd speak to us personally and individually about the Great Commission. God, we pray that you would speak as the teacher. We pull a seat up to your table. You be the teacher. We're the student. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. If you're taking notes, I want to encourage you to write down, right out the text, we see this, the posture of of the disciples. If you're not taking notes, you can act like it. It makes you look holy. The po <laughs> well, it does, right? The posture of the disciples. So here is Jesus at the end of his ministry. He is literally about to be ascended. He's going to go into heaven. He's going to be with the Father. This is the end of his ministry. And I want to submit to you, everything up to this point led to this moment. See, for Jesus, discipleship was not theoretical. It was not philosophical. It was not intellectual. This was a, a process and a plan whereby every message he spoke, every miracle he performed, every healing he did, everything led up to this. I mean, this was the zenith, if you will, uh, of everything that he said up to this point. And what he's about to tell them is, I want you to do something that I did before you. Here's a side note to the leaders in here today. And I think we're all leaders in some sense or another. You can't, ex write this down, you can't expect from other people something you're not emulating yourself, right? You can't expect from others something you're not emulating. What I mean is, if you want your family to be a family of prayer, then brother, father, you need to be a man of prayer, right? If you want your family to be in the word, mom, then you need to be emulating that in the word and then expecting that. As a pastor of this church, if you want your people to be generous in their time and their talent and their treasure, then we need to be generous, right? So Jesus emulated it, and then now he's going to expect it from them. And so it says they gathered together on the mountain, and this has always puzzled me. They worshiped him, but somewhat. Has anybody ever had a problem with that one? I mean, just like wonder, what is that about? Anybody? I've asked myself the question, what is going on here? And it's, it's key for us to kind of unpack that word doubted. That word doubted, according to the BDAG, which is just a, a lexicon, a kind of a dictionary of the New Testament Greek. Here's what, what the Bible's, uh, the lexicon says. That word means to be uncertain about taking a particular action or going in a particular direction. It also means to be hesitant. So what in the world are they hesitant about? Now, up to this point, you probably say, well, they're, they're uncertain about Jesus. Like, is Jesus really God? You could think that. 
Uh, or is Jesus really the Messiah? Or is this the mission Jesus wants us to do? And so all those things may be an option. Well, I did a study years ago, preached a series after Easter Sunday. A lot of pastors will preach a series on the seven sayings of the cross, right? Like Jesus talking up to his death. I started a series years ago called Discourses After Death. I wanted to know about the encounters about Jesus and people after he died, right? So the road to Emmaus, Jesus with the disciples. And when I preached that series, I realized that on this occasion, guess how many times Jesus has already appeared to the disciples? Guess what number this is? Four. See, these guys had already seen him four times. John chapter 20, you remember? They're all huddled in the room. Thomas is not there. Jesus comes through and he says, peace be with you. And they're scared. They think he's a ghost. He breathes the Holy Spirit upon them, encounter one. Later in John chapter 20, Thomas is there. We know Thomas is a lawyer because he's always asking questions, right? That's a joke. He's like, look, if I don't see him and I don't touch him, I, don't, I, I, I won't believe. So Jesus comes in again, repairs to the disciples. Number two, John 21, they're on the seashore. We know Jesus is a Cajun from New Orleans because he eats catfish for breakfast. We know that. So we do in New Orleans, right? So Jesus is cooking a, a fish po' boy for breakfast, and the but he is, right? He, disciples come in. That's the third occasion. This is the fourth occasion. So it shows us there's no way they can doubt Jesus. There's no way they're doubting the resurrection. Come in close. What are they doubting? I think they're doubting themselves. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, I think what they're saying is, listen, we've already seen what can happen to him. We already know what they just did. I mean, they persecuted him. They beat He didn't do anything wrong. And, and, and what if they do that to us? I mean, what if we go to jail? What if we're in prison? What if they pray? Or even worse, what if they kill us? And I believe in the middle of this bantering back and forth, I want you to picture it, Jesus just kind of interrupts. He kind of intersects that dialogue. So they're like, hey, what if they kill us? What if they pray? Jesus is like, shh, be quiet. And then he says these words. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Any questions? <laughs> That's what he says, right? So here's what Jesus does. He moves the posture of the disciples, which is in a sense hesitant, doubting, write this down, to the providence of God. He moves their focus on themselves to the providence of God. And Jesus starts by saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Isn't it interesting, I find this fascinating, that the one thing Jesus has authorized us to do as his disciples is the very thing we lack in doing, making disciples. You ever thought about that? Like, that's the only thing Jesus ever authorized us to do. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go make disciples. Now, what he does is he wants them to focus on the fact that God's in control. And what he does is, look at the text. He uses this inclusive word all four times. I want you to see it. Notice what he says. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Make disciples of what? All nations. Teach them to obey what? All my commands, and I'll be with you what? All the time. You know what he's saying? I'm in control. Now what he says is, he says there's two ways to think of it. First, I'm in control of heaven, and secondly, I'm in control of earth. Write down heaven. I think what he's saying here is this, the same authority that God has granted the Son in heaven now is realized on earth. Uh, I love our worship team actually quoted the very verse that, that I'm going to read, Colossians 1.16 is a great proof text of this. Listen to what Paul says to the church of Colossae, talking about Jesus. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. I want to give you a pop quiz tonight. When you think of Jesus the man in the Gospels, and you cannot pick zero as the center, 
Okay, so you can't say, well, he's both one and the other. If you have to pick a side, do you view Jesus in the Gospels more as all man or all God? Just, don't answer out loud, just think. He's both all man and all God. I know he is. I get that. Okay, the hypostatic union. I get that. But I want to prove a point to you. If you're like me, the pendulum normally swiss or, or swings to all God, right? Because we know him as God. Yes, he was a man, but he's more God. Do you know that is the exact opposite of the apostles' mindset when he was here? See, Jesus, they, they knew he was a man. He didn't have to convince them of that. They knew he was a man. He had to convince them his entire ministry he was God. John, John chapter 8, remember this? They're quizzing Jesus, and they're like, are you greater than our father Abraham who came before you? And what does Jesus say? Before Abraham was, I am. Now, what he's doing there is he's using that connection, I am, to Exodus 3, which God talked about. That was his name. John chapter 10, my father has given them to me. He's greater than all of them. No one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. And so what we see about Jesus is, yes, he's both all God and all man. But as he was here on earth, he was trying to prove to these guys that he wasn't just a man, that he was all God. And now we see he's the God of heaven. Always was, always is. But secondly, we see that he has authority over earth. So turn with me to Mark 1. The gospel writer Mark was really bent on trying to prove to us that Jesus had authority over all things. Authority means he's king. Authority means he's in control. I want to take you on just this cursory study, just simply through, through the gospel of Mark, to show you how he's just proving in a repeated, rapid-fire manner that Jesus has authority. Look at 113. If you're taking notes, write down, Jesus has authority over the animals. He was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was what? With the wild animals. Now, I don't know if you know this, but being with wild animals is not a good thing, right? I heard there are wild animals in Canada, right? Are there? Pretty... You remember the saying, lions and tigers and bears? That's a bad thing. Okay, that's a bad thing. But here with Jesus, we don't see that he's just with the wild animals. In the language of the New Testament, circle that word with there in that, in that section. I learned this in my first semester Greek class. My professor, who's a Greek scholar, said that word with gives us the idea that Jesus was with them in harmony. He is with the animals. They are, they are one around him. They're not trying to attack him. They're not ripping him apart. They are one in harmony with him. Jesus has authority over the animals. Secondly, Jesus has authority over the angels. Look at verse 13. The angels were serving him. Now, why is that important? Because Psalm 2a tells us that the angels are made just a little above man. That man is made a little below the angels. Well, Jesus, as the son of man, actually is being served by the angels. He has authority over the angels. He also has authority to teach. Look at verse 22. The people were astonished at his teaching because he taught them as one who had what? Authority. They never heard anything like this. He also had authority over nature and the demons. Look at verse 34. When they were gathered together from the whole town, he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because he knew them. He also had authority to forgive sins. Look at chapter 2, verse 9. You remember the paralytic. The four friends bring the man. They lay him down, and Jesus says, which is it easier to say to you, to, to pick up your bed and walk or to say that your sins are forgiven? What he's saying is this. I can say I'm God and forgive sins, but you can't prove that. But to prove to you that I'm God and can forgive sins, I'm going to physically heal this man to prove it to you. So he tells the man, take your bread and walk and go home. He has authority to forgive sins. He also has authority over the Sabbath. Look at chapter 2, verse 28. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for Sabbath. So then the Son of Man is even Lord over what? Over the I love Jesus has the authority to give authority. Look at chapter 3, verse 15. He calls the 12 to himself, and he empowers them and gives them authority to drive out demons, and he appointed the 12 to go out. Here's the point. Look at me. Time and time again, we see that Jesus Christ has authority over all things. Don't you think if Jesus has authority to create the world to put the stars in the sky, to put the planets into place, to have authority over the Sabbath and healing and demons and nature and animals, don't you think you can trust him with your life? 
Don't you think you can trust him? Somebody needs to hear this today. The sovereignty of God for your life as a Christian is the greatest news you'll ever hear. Because here's the deal. There are no accidents in the economy of God. Aren't you glad of that? There are no accidents in the economy of God. God is never surprised by anything. He is always in control of everything. And what I look at it is this. The, the sovereignty of God is like a black curtain on a play or on the stage of a play where it's kind of there. You never notice the curtain is there until it's not there, but that's the sovereignty of God. God is always there. He's always working. He's always in control. I heard a story of a, of a guy who was waiting for his wife to get dressed. I know this never happens in your home, but I heard it happening in some homes where the wife was getting dressed and the husband was waiting. And uh, thank God my wife is never late, so thankfully she's, she actually beats me at times, but it takes a while to fix this hair. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, so, <laughs> but it does. So, <laughs> so, so he's waiting for his wife. She's getting dressed. He's watching their favorite football team. They're about to go on a long trip to see uh, her family sits down, their favorite football team is playing, and uh, it gets to the end of the game, he watches the game, the team is down, they need two touchdowns to win. And he's like, there's no way they're going to win, two minutes left in the game. But miraculously, they come back, they throw a touchdown, they score with just seconds on the clock, they kick an onside kick, they get the ball back, they have one play from the 50-yard line, miraculously. Quarterback drops back, takes the ball, throws a Hail Mary pass into the end zone. Receiver running full speed, dives into the end zone, outstretched, catches the ball, pulls it in, touchdown, they win. The He's going crazy. Like, I can't believe I just saw this. He turns the television off. He yells to his wife, honey, it's time to go. They get in the car. They're driving down the road about an hour or two into the trip, and she's scanning through the channels, and the replay of the game is on. To which she says, hey, honey, our team is playing. She has no clue it's the replay. Says, honey, our team's playing. And she says, oh, man, they're down by two touchdowns. They'll never come back. He grabs her arm and he says, leave it. I'll bet you. <laughs> I will bet you. They, How much you want to bet? She's, he said, I'll bet you whatever you want, right? You're just grabbing her. Whatever you want to bet. She said, you're on. They sat there driving down the road. They get, the, they get the ball. They throw the first touch in. She's going crazy. The whole time she's looking at her husband. He is calm, cool, and collected. She's like, what is, what is wrong with you? Like, like, are you not into the game? He's like, no, honey, listen, I have faith. <laughs> I have faith. Don't know about you, but I've got faith, right? They come down to the last few seconds. Onside kick. The quarterback gets the ball, drops back at the 50, throws the bomb into the air. She is literally sweating bullets on the edge of her seat, listening to the radio. Receiver catches the ball in the end zone. They win. The she goes crazy. She leans over to her husband, who hasn't even moved. You know, he's just calm, cool, and collected, driving down the road. She's like, what is wrong with you? He says, honey, I have to be honest. He said, I listened to the game earlier, and here's what he said. He said, I already knew we win in the end. Christian, listen to me. It doesn't matter how bleak the world looks today. We win in the end. Amen? Aren't you glad of that? We win in the end. Listen, we're on the whole team. The game's already been played. The work has been finished on the cross. And we win in the end. And Jesus says, listen, just go play the game and enjoy yourself because I've won. Aren't you glad of that today? Jesus has won for us. What Jesus says to these guys is, listen, all authority has been given to me. You can't lose. Therefore, I'm going to give you a plan. So we see the posture of the disciples. We see the focus on the providence of God. Here's the final thing. We see the plan of action. Here's the plan of action. Very simple. Verse 19. Jesus says, write this down. Make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations. Verse 19. Go therefore... And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'll be with you always to the end of the age. Now, I want you to understand something. In that first section, 18 and 19, there is one imperative in the text. There's one command. For years, I thought the command was go, or the command could have been baptize, or the command even could have been teach. But baptize, go, and teach are like three stools 
that in a sense hold up the mantle, which is the mandate to make disciples. So basically think of it this way. The mandate is to make disciples, and the way we do that is by going, baptizing, and teaching. Now, to be a disciple, get this, is to be a learner. That's what the word means. In fact, the Greek word mathetes, which is the word disciple, is where we get the English word what? Mathematics. And if you took math in high school like me, it was tough. Anybody with me? <laughs> it requires discipline. It requires work. It requires energy. Same thing ha happens in being a disciple. You don't haphazardly fall into discipleship. Anybody with me? It's not going to happen by happenstance. And so when you think about a disciple, to be a disciple, in order to make disciples, you've got to be a disciple. I want you to think of it this way. To be a disciple is to be a co-worker. And I want to tell you something. The leadership of this church needs you to be engaged here. Like there's a lot of consumers in this world, people who say, what can the kingdom do for me? We don't need any more of those in the church. We have enough, just to be honest. If I could speak, can I speak freely? We, and I say this with a lot of humility. We need more co-workers, right? We need people who see that God has gifted them and utilize gifts in their life or will utilize gifts to advance the kingdom of God. Now, the challenge for us is this, is that that's not the way we've been taught all our life, right? And the challenge for pastors is that we always need more people to engage in ministry. I, I realized years ago, I read a story years ago, sorry, uh, about uh, a man uh, in a book called The Lost Art of Disciple Making, which is a great little book by a guy named Leroy Imes. And you may not have heard of him, but you may have heard of The Navigator. So he was a navigator. He wrote this book about how a guy he discipled was a young pastor in a growing church. Pastor called him on the phone. He said, Brother Leroy, I need your help. He said, I've got an amazing church. He said, more people are getting saved than have gotten saved in years. We've baptized more people this year than the last few years combined. He said, we have exciting worship. We have people coming and serving, or people coming and attending. He said, we have more people at our members meeting. He said, there's a lot of excitement at the church. He said, but here's the problem. He said, the problem is I need someone in my church who can do more than take my sermons to people who are shut in. I need more than someone who can stand up at a members meeting and lead it. I need more of someone who can just bear an identity badge as a deacon. I need someone who can do more than just take up the offering as an usher. All of those things are important. He said, what I need is someone who can share the gospel with a lost person. Watch this. Disciple them through the process of maturity and then replicate the process in the life of another person. He said, Brother Leroy, when I looked at my church, I realized I had no one that could do that. I was pastoring a church of 65 people, South Louisiana, on the bayou. First church I'd ever pastored. And I looked out at my congregation, no indictment on them. And I asked myself the same question. And you know what I answered? I had no one either. I want you to ask yourself just an honest question tonight. Do you feel confident that you could share the gospel with a lost person, disciple that person into full maturity of the stature of Christ, and then encourage them to launch and replicate their lives? A lot of you say, well, I don't feel confident to do that, and it's not even your fault. Sadly, the reason, get this, that you feel inadequate to do that is because you haven't been taught that that is expected of you. And so for centuries, I mean, follow me here, historically through Christian tradition and doctrine and centuries, we have not taught people that discipleship is mandated as a Christian. I mean, think of it this way. Following Jesus is optional, but salvation is essential, right? Well, you don't want to go to hell, do you? You need to be saved. But then following Jesus is an option and discipleship is a choice and no one ever chooses discipleship. Why would I want to do work? Why would I want to advance the gospel? I just want to be saved. And I want to submit to you, as I read the Bible, that's not a biblical doctrine. See, what Jesus shows us in the Bible is this, and I want you to get this. Not only does God save us from something, get this, God actually saves us for something, right? And he has gifted each of you in, in an interesting and unique way and if you never figure out what God has saved you for, then you miss out on this great Christian abundant life that Jesus talks about. See, because if the gospel is only to get your sins forgiven, 
then what happens is, I mean, think about this. Salvation becomes a transaction of answering a spiritual questionnaire where if you repeat the right words at the right time, the right way, then you have a place in heaven so that when God comes back with the spiritual scanner in heaven and you have the right barcode, he's going to scan your number and you go up to heaven. And here's what happens. If that's the mindset we have, then serving in the church is optional. Following Jesus, obedience is a choice, and I don't want all that. I just want to go to heaven. But friends, let me tell you something. Not only did Jesus save us from something, and we're grateful for that, he actually saved us for something. So let me ask you, what did he save you for? Because when you start to realize this, you realize that spiritual disciplines are essential to growth, right? Now, now I, I asked you earlier if I could speak freely, but let, let, me just, let me just continue that thread for just a moment. If following Jesus is optional and salvation is essential, then why would you even engage in spiritual disciplines? Like, why, why, why do I even read the... Whether I read the Bible or not, I'm still going to heaven, right? Prayer becomes optional. Giving, become, giving of your finances is an optional thing. Church doesn't need my money. I don't need to give. My, giving your time is optional. Going overseas is optional. Serving is optional. And we wonder, I mean, we live in a day and age where Christians or salvation is essential, following Jesus is optional, where there are well-meaning, identifying Christians, if I could speak with great humility, who are more interested on Sunday in going to see the maple leaves play and cheering and ranting and wearing clothes and memorabilia and outfits, but they are neglecting worshiping the God of heaven here on Sunday, and they think that's Christianity. Does somebody know what I'm talking about here? And I'm not trying to grind an axe with a particular person. I'm just saying, if you only think your whole goal in life is to get saved and go to heaven and to put your spiritual life on hold and wait till your role is called up yonder so you can be there, then I'm telling you, you are missing out on this wonderful thing called the Christian life. Because listen, when I wake up every day, the Christian life is an adventure. That's why it's called the Great Commission. It's not the great mission. He could have done it without us, but it's the great co-mission. And what happens is we see that spiritual maturity is essential, right? Sanctification is expected. Now, Kenny and I, Candy, Candy and I, I say Kenny. People say Kenny and I. It's Candy and I, but it sounds like Kenny. And that's politically not right. But anyway, don't tweet that. Um, <laughs> so we have two boys. Uh, they're nine and seven, just turned nine and seven, Rig and Ryder. They just sound tough, and they are tough, I'm going to tell you. Uh, we named them after a trucking company, right, Rig, and they're tough as nails, and we didn't know that at the time, but somebody told us that after. So, but, but people come up to us all the time, are you going to go for the girl? Right? You ever ask, anybody have like two of the same uh, gender, and people say, are you going to go for the girl? And I'm like, is that like what you're supposed to have as, as, as like, like a believer, like a boy? Like the family's not complete to have a boy and a girl. And my response to them is, listen, if you would have went through what we went through with our two boys, you wouldn't go for the girl either. And I'm just going to be, and we love our kids. <laughs> we love our kids. But we went through colic with both of them. Anybody ever been through colic? I'm just telling you right now. There's purgatory and colic, okay? I'm just saying, <laughs> if there is purgatory, there's pur I mean, I'm going to say, here's what colic is for those who don't understand. It is an underdeveloped stomach. Rig, our oldest, had it for about a month and a half. Ryder had it nonstop for two months, and I'm not making this up. And what it is is this. The baby cannot get satisfied or pacified because when they cry to eat, you feed them, and then after they eat, the stomach hurts, so they cry again. And then they cry because they're hungry, and you feed. And it is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, insanity in the home. Just going to be honest with you. I mean, we tried everything. We tried the gas drops. You know what I'm talking about. We tried colic calm. We tried NyQuil. No, we didn't try NyQuil. We didn't try NyQuil. We thought about it. No, we thought about it. I thought about it, but I didn't think that'd be good. But anyway, <laughs> we tried, I mean, we tried everything. You know, we put the baby on, on, the, on the washing machine, you know, supposed to shave it. You, you put the baby in the car, you drive around the block. That just made it worse, right? Just made us more angry. We love babies. Don't hear what I'm not saying. We love babies. You love babies. We all love babies. But here's the reality. Eventually, a baby grows up, right? Like a baby becomes a, a, a middle schooler, and a middle schooler becomes a high schooler, and a high schooler goes to college, and, and the college student gets married and moves out of mom and dad's house, hopefully one day, and then, and then they, get, they get married and have a family. 
Listen, when a man is grown up and he still acts like a child, we don't celebrate that. We investigate that as a problem. Now, hear what I'm about to tell you. A 50-year-old man who is still walking around with a spiritual pacifier in his mouth because he's an immature Christian is not something we should applaud in the church today. And one of the things I realize is that biblical maturity is not equated with, with attendance in church. Just because you've been in church all your life doesn't mean you're spiritually mature. And so what Jesus is telling these guys is this. I want you guys to grow up, right? I want you to be mature. I want you to develop into the image of who I am. I, I love what uh, Oswald Chambers said, and, and I'll leave you with this, and then we'll move on. Oswald Chambers said this. He said, the number one goal of the devil is to keep a believer useless. It's pretty good. The number one goal of the devil is to keep a believer useless. So Jesus says, here's the plan of action. Make disciples of all nations. Number two, trust the Lord in all situations. Did you know, and this is a recent discovery for me, that there are actually two commands in the Great Commission. Like we've always said, the command is make disciples. But did you know there are actually two imperatives in the text? Make disciples, and here's the second one, verse 20. Lo, or the ESV I think says, behold, I'll be with you to the end of the age. So how in the world can we command lo, remember, I'll be with you to the end of the age? Why would Jesus say that? Here's why I think Jesus would say that. Because for any of us who have ever been in a discipling relationship, discipleship is messy. Can anybody amen to that? You know why discipleship is messy? Because people are messy. And let me just tell you something. You're messy. You know how I know you're messy? Because I'm messy, right? We're all messy. So Jesus said when you're discipling people, when you're reaching the nation with the gospel, when you're investing in people, it's going to be messy. You're going to want to throw in the towel. Don't. Look to me. Trust in me. Know that I'm with you. And isn't it cool that our Lord bookends the presence and the power of God around this mission? All authority is mine, and by the way, I'm never going to leave you. Now, I want to leave you with this, and I want you to get this, because people say, well, how do I do this? The bedrock for all discipleship is the Word of God, okay? The Bible is the, is the foundation for everything we do. And I like to say it this way, a Christian never graduates from the Bible, Write that down. It's a great way to remember how God uses it. You ne what I mean is, you don't get a degree and you say, oh, we're done with this one, we're looking for book number two. This is the book. You never graduate from this book. And listen, the Bible does the work itself. One of the greatest things you can do week in and week out is come to the worship gathering here to sit under the teaching of the Word of God where the Word of God begins to change you as you get in the Word until the Word gets into you. And listen, we don't have to dress it up. We don't have to make it fancy. We don't have to make it relevant. It works when the word works in your life, right? I heard a story of a Gideon in South Africa. This Gideon had gone on this trip many years to a, to a small village in South Africa. And uh, the, the village was very remote. And he had those pocket New Testaments. You guys have seen those little pocket New Testaments before. And he would give them out to the townspeople. One year he was there. And he heard about a man who was the local drug dealer. He was kind of the, kind of the kingpin of the town, ruining the community with drugs and, and uh, just kind of ravaging by selling drugs. And everybody knew this, but the guy was so powerful, he was really untouchable. And so the missionary, the pastor missionary said, I want to go talk to him and give him a Bible. They said, oh, no, pastor, he's not going to take a Bible. Don't, don't do that. Well, the pastor was fearless. He went up, he walked up to the man, and he said, hey, listen, he said, I want to get through a translate. I want to give you this Bible. Would you accept this Bible? The man takes the Bible, the little Gideon New Testament, and he kind of thumbs through the pages, and he says, I'm not going to read this Bible. He said, no, 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 keep it. He said, sir, if you give me this Bible, he said, the only thing I'm going to do is tear these pages out and smoke joints with it. True story. The pastor, thinking quick on his feet, said, I don't care. Just do me a favor. Every page you rip out, do me a favor and read it before you smoke it. <laughs> Just read it before you smoke. Guy said, sure, I love this paper. It's actually perfect rolling paper, so I think I can use it. That's what he said. The pastor goes home, comes back a few years later. When he gets to the town, he realizes that there is a revival that had taken place in that community. 
In fact, many people had gotten saved, and so naturally he wanted to know what was the cause of that. And they said, oh, brother pastor, you're never going to believe this. It's the guy who was the local drug dealer, now turned believer, and now pastor. He's like the pastor of this community. So he went to find this man. True story. He went and found this man. He said, hey, listen, tell me what happened. He said, you don't even look the same. Tell me what happened. He said, pastor, can I be honest with you? He said, sure, I want you to. He said, well, I smoked through Matthew. And then I smoked through Mark, is what he said. <laughs> and he said, Pastor, I honestly smoked through Luke. He said, he said but when I read John, John smoked me. For, I mean, listen to me. It's the power of the word of God, right? Aren't you grateful of that? Praise God. It's the word. Listen to me. I want to leave you with this. I do not want you to underestimate the power of the word of God and the empowerment in the spirit, by the spirit of God through the people of God for the glory of God, for the renown of God's name. Listen to me. Here's my challenge. I want you to prayerfully consider getting involved in a discipling relationship in this church. You guys are on the cusp of something here where God is starting this movement of disciple making. It's this undercurrent in your church. So here's the challenge. If you're not in a discipleship group or a D group, I want you to get involved in one. But maybe you're in here today and you're saying, Pastor, I can do this. I'm a believer. I have the Spirit of God. I'm wielding the Word of God, and I can invest in the people of God. I want to challenge you. Start a group, meet for the next year, and you watch what God would do in your life. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the empowerment of the Spirit. And God, we're grateful that the gospel didn't just come to us to stop with us, but we're grateful that the gospel came to us because it was heading to someone else. And I pray today, God, that you would start a revival among the people that it would be so unstoppable and so noticeable in this town that people would stand up and take note and say, what is going on at Harvest? Hey, why don't you come see? God, God is here. And, and that, that this church wouldn't be known for a particular worship leader or a particular staff member or even the preaching of the pastor, that people would come here and when they walk in this door, they would be enveloped with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And when they leave this place, they will say, I don't know who actually is leading the charge, but we do know Jesus is there. God, would you do a revival through this church that not only would it spread to this community, but all the regions of Canada and Ontario, even down to the States. And when they look back, they would say, that is something only God could do. You be glorified today, we ask it. And the only name we know how. And that is the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ. And God's people said, <laughs>